Thank you, Pastor. We, uh, we always look forward to coming and being with you guys. It's been about five or six months since we were here. And uh, has anybody figured out this has been a unique time for about the last year and a half? You know, I've been around a long time. Uh, I'm 68 years old, and I've never seen days like this. But I've never had more excitement inside of me. I've been preaching a long time. I mean, uh, this and July, it'll be 50 years since I've been born again, and most of that time has been in some kind of ministry. But during that time, I have seen things unfold and unfurl, and I thought, God, what in the world are you doing? This, though, is a strategic plan that God has got in motion, and we're about to encounter something we've never encountered before in the body of Christ. You know, I was, uh, Libby and I were with a group of pastors uh, and ministers from all over the country, Alaska, Arizona, Florida, up and down the East Coast. We spent Friday with them down in Greenville with our pastor, Ron Carpenter, Jr. And uh, they were just, you know, from the ones who were sharing the word was phenomenal. But just talking to some of these guys, they are walking through things now that they thought they would never have to see. Yeah. You know, I've seen, we've seen churches devastated. We've seen ministries close. But now I'm telling you, there, it's all, there's always a purpose, always a plan. God has not lost sight of what's going on. Amen. And the Lord's been sharing some things with me now. I'll be honest with you. This is the first place I've preached this. Um, <laughs> when, when Pastor Mike, I, I don't know what day it was, Monday or Tuesday, something like that, he uh, called me and said, you know, can you be here this Sunday? And, uh, and I said, yeah, that Sunday is open. So I told him we'd come. And I'm thinking, Lord, you really want me to drop this in their lap this morning. Because I ain't preached this nowhere, but this is what God's saying to us uh, uh, corporately together in the group that we're part of. Understand this, in Genesis chapter 6, we know it's the story of Noah. Now listen to this in verse number 5 of Genesis 6. It said, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of his thoughts and of his heart was only evil continually. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yes. All right. Now you say, are you, is God ready, about ready to destroy this earth? Let me put it to you this way. If you have got your bags packed to go to heaven, unpack them. Because he said he would not come, Jesus, until the gospel of the kingdom had been preached to all the earth. And the gospel of the kingdom has not yet been preached. Oh, some of y'all were hoping you're going Monday, didn't you? Now you say, you say well, if you're wrong, when we get to heaven, I'm going to talk to you. If I'm wrong and we get to heaven, you ain't going to have that on your mind. <laughs> I'm safe in saying this because you, you ain't going to jump my case up there in heaven because there's going to be too much other things to see. Yeah. But here we see God said everything they thought was evil. Mm -hmm. That's all they can imagine was evil. Mm -hmm. But at the, and, and verse number eight of that, even he said, I'm going to wipe them out. He said, he said but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now that word grace as it's used here means he found God's favor, God's graciousness, his kindness, his beauty, his pleasantness, his charm, his attractiveness, loveliness, and affectionate regard. Now he said, because you have found that, have you ever prayed that God give me favor? We don't even realize what you pray sometimes. He, when you tap into the favor of God, everything shifts. Everything changes. In a perverse and wicked time, so wicked, God said, I'm going to start over. But he said, I have found a remnant. Look at your neighbor and said, he's looking for a remnant. He found a remnant and said, because you have tapped into my nature. Now, some people want to say, well, that's who Noah was. No, he was a drunken sailor. That's how he ended up. But the thing about it is that he found part of God that nobody else found. He found favor with God. Now, if you go on and read through there, uh, it, it talks about it later in, in chapter 6. It talks about, he said, all this flesh has come before me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drown them all out. It's over with. But he gave, he gave Noah, I almost said Moses, he gave Noah a plan and a blueprint for the means to walk in that favor. He said, I'm going to show you exactly what you need. We're going to build something. God is building something in his people right now. Why? Because we have tapped into the favor of God. Understand this, favor does not mean that you're going to have somebody walk up to you and give you a $5 million check. I'm not saying they're not, but that's not what God's favor is. It's ste you step into his, the righteousness through Christ Jesus, and suddenly there you are, and God smiles on you. Amen. Better than, it's better than Wells Fargo ever could smile on you. 
He says, God smiles on you. But then in verse number 18, he says, now I'm going to give you a plan, a blueprint. I'm going to tell you how big to build this ark. I'm going to tell you how to load it. But he says this in verse number 18 of Genesis 6, I will establish my covenant with you and you will go into the ark as well. The covenant of God cannot be broken. We can break our side, but he will never break his. And what I see coming, what I hear happening, is that God is ready to show himself strong. Now, some people say, well, you know, I, I've heard them preach this recently, you know, that before that in Genesis 2, there, was never, there had never been rain. Now, you can't say that for a fact, because after the fall of man, we don't know what happened. Shifts and weather patterns, weather patterns, we don't know that. Understand, in the garden, Adam did not have to till the ground. He spoke to it. After his fall, he had to till the ground. So there was a need for rain, but I'm not saying there was or there wasn't. I don't know. But understand this. He said, I want you to build something not for the now, but for what's coming. Amen. He did not need the ark. It took him 120 years to build, for the, build in the now so that he could embrace what was coming. There has been something stirring in the body of Christ for years. Understand this. When you really begin to look at this, there was things that happened. In 1720 to 1740, now, think about it. what happened fairly close after this was the birth of this nation in 1776. But in that period of 20 years between 1720 and 1740, it was called the Great Awakening in America. There was a release of God's glory over this land. Now, when you begin to understand this, when that took place, in 1896, in a place here in North Carolina called Camp Creek, down near Murphy, Ken and Libby and I went down there, and we saw it for ourselves. I had to hunt it out. The people of Murphy, even the mayor of that city, I called him. I ain't never heard of Camp Creek, don't know anything about it. But we went down there and found it. About a 16-year-old girl showed us where it was at. There was a move of God in 1896 that took place in the, in the lives of uh, black folks, uh, Indians and poor white people in a schoolhouse called Shearer's Schoolhouse, the first place we have record of in America of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. Ten years before it ever happened on Azusa Street. But it happened here in Western North Carolina. Now then, in 1900 comes along, actually 1904 and 1905, there was a Welsh revival. Have you ever heard of the Welsh revival? I'm going somewhere with this, so hang on. And then 1906, now remember, 1904 and 1905, a great outpouring of God's Spirit in, in Wales. Now in 1906, we have Azusa Street. Since then, in the 40s and 50s, there came a great healing revival. In the 60s and 70s, the Jesus Movement. In the late 70s and early 80s, the Word of Faith. Now the apostolic and the prophetic has been awakened. And why is that happening? Because, now get this, this is what the Lord dropped in my spirit a few weeks ago. He says, prepare for another Pentecost. Prepare for another Pentecost. Why? Because that is the only thing that can change the culture that we're in right now. It's not going to change because of who we do or do not put in office. Amen. You say, but don't, don't, don't you want certain people in office? Yes, I do. But understand this. No matter who goes into office, it does not eliminate God's purpose and plan. Amen. Was I upset when the elections didn't go the way I thought it was? Yeah, I was. I'll be honest with you. I got, I got mad. I was in a meeting on that Wednesday morning following that Tuesday night, and they got to talking about it. I looked at Libby and I said, let's go. I said, I'm not going to. She said, where are we going? I said, out. You say, you walked out of a meeting? I walked in. I can walk out. I just didn't want to hear it. I was, I mean, I was fit to be tied the whole day until I got alone with God that night out of my driveway. And I am letting God have it. I said, God, what are you doing? And you know what he told me? I got somebody to answer me there. You know what he told me? God told me, he said, trust me. So when all hell breaks loose around me, I go, what? Trust me. That's what he said. Trust me. So when we begin to see this, do you, re do you really want to know what I think Pentecost would look like? God is, God is asking the church to expand its boundaries because we have got settled in church. Do you realize we're in some churches that would almost give anything they have to have a crowd like this on Sunday morning to be this close to maximum capacity? I mean, there are churches right now that have 20% of their people coming back. There are people who are hanging in the balance, about to lose property, about to have buildings taken away from them because they can no longer make a mortgage payment. 
What is going on? God is preparing his people. Why? Because there is something, Pastor Mike, to be unleashed that you cannot imagine. So go with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 1. I mean, I know what time it is now. You say, how do you know that? Because I started timing my sermons. Okay. You say, why do I know that? Why do I, because your spirit can only handle as much as your butt can. <laughs> I know you're not supposed to say butt in church, but I do. You can only handle so long, and I don't want to abuse your time, but can I download some things to you this morning? Yes. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse number 4. And being assembled together with them, this is speaking of Jesus, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. How many has ever heard this preached before? The rest of you are lying. You cannot hang around full gospel, charismatic, Pentecostal people without somebody bringing this up. I don't know how many times I've preached it, but the Lord has begun to show me a few things that I have not seen before quite in this life. Because the first thing I want to focus on, he says, you've got to stay here. This is not a time to jump fence and run. We have, we have created a condition. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're doing Facebook Live, that's great. But we created a condition where people feel justified now staying at home with a cup of coffee and Dunkin' Donut and having church. Now, let me tell you, I understand sometimes medically people can't come. There's things wrong physically. But let me, they, you do never underestimate the power of communion together. Don't ever underestimate that. He said one, one of his things he said was, forsake not the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is, even more so when you see the day approaching. Do you think we're seeing the day approaching? But he said, no, you got to stay here for right now. He says, do not depart from Jerusalem. Don't jump ship and run. Now, they had reason because they were hunted men. Because of their association with Jesus, people were looking to get rid of them. But he says, but wait for the promise of the Father. When, it means, when he says that, wait for that promise, it's both the promise and the thing promised. It's a full manifestation. It's not just what he said he's going to do, it's the doing of the fact. He says, now, the promise that's coming, you've been waiting on it, but I'm going to manifest it. They had walked with him, some of them, for three, three and a half years, and they had heard this about the kingdom, about the kingdom, about the kingdom. But have you ever heard someone speak a prophetic word and you kind of sit back and wonder, hmm, I wonder if that'll ever happen. Thirty-some years ago, Libby and I were in a service. I wasn't a pastor then. I, was just, I, I just run the band and I, I played the drums and made sure everything was ready. And we were in a little bitty building on a Sunday night. We still were real holy back then. We had Sunday night. And we were in Sunday night service and a prophet was up there preaching. He has preached his heart out. He's speaking prophetically over people. And suddenly he says, where's Chuck? This is over 30 years ago. And he says, come up here, come up here. And then he called Libby up here. And he spoke a prophetic word over us over 30 years ago that we're just now seeing come to pass. The promise and the fulfillment of the promise. He said, if you'll do what I say, this next Pentecost, he said, you, you take your promises that I've given you and you expect the manifestation of those things. He said, then, he said, they got, they immediately they said, okay, now do it now. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Why? Because they had him there. As long as he was there, they had saw him raise the dead, feed the, feed the hungry. They saw him heal the sick, and they said, do it now because you're here. But they had to step into an arena of faith they had never walked in before, doing it without his physical presence. So they're trying to get him to do it before he's out of here. Have you ever tried to... <laughs> Negotiate with God. God, if you'll do this now, I'll really get involved. But what if he says, no, I've got to let you stand in your own arena of faith. The last few years, the last 10 or so years, 12, well, actually coming up on 13 years since we walked out of pastoring uh, a church, we have had to learn to walk in a realm of faith that I did not have to walk before that. Why? Because every Monday morning we got a paycheck. Huh? The church took good care of us. They bought me cars. 
They sent me on vacation. They sent me to conferences. They took care of me. Then suddenly, where you at, Jesus? <laughs> I look at the checkbook. I say, you ain't in there. <laughs> but God says you've got to learn to walk in a new realm of faith. If you're going to embrace the fullness of this coming Pentecost, you've got to be willing to say, I'll walk it whether I see it or not. Uh, that'll go over real big. He said, if you'll do that. He says, then the times and seasons come into play. And understand, he says, nobody has authority over times and seasons but the Father. Why do you think Jesus never did say, this is when I'm coming back? Because he said, the Father controls the times and seasons. That means the, the quality and the quantity of time. What you, how long you have and what's in that time. He says, I control that. We have looked at this past year and a half or so, something like that, and I know maybe I'm the only one that'll, that'll admit it in this room, but I've wondered, God, this don't look good. You ever had to rein your emotions in? Like I did on the day after the election? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've heard all the, pe all, all the naysayers say things about COVID, but since I was here, I had COVID. I had it for two weeks. I'd have had to die to feel better. Ask Libby. I don't, I don't I, you know, I, 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 if I get sick, leave me alone. She'd come around every now and check my pulse, make sure I was still breathing. I was the sickest I've ever been in my life. It wouldn't have hurt, it wouldn't have hurt my feelings a bit if the rapture had happened right in the middle of it. I mean, it, I was miserable. So I know it's real. Here's the way, if you were a man of faith, you wouldn't have had it. Have it your way then. I know you never have anything come against you. And when I can't taste and I can't smell, that bad. <laughs> you can tell I like to eat. But he says these times and seasons, he said, God's got to work this thing out. I would have loved to have Pentecost the day after I got born again. I've had, I've had seasons in my life, God will you not do something now. But here we are in 2021 and we're almost halfway through this year and God says... It's knocking at the door. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Why? Because the time and season has come. i got to go on. He says, well, at, in that time and season, you shall receive power. Say power. power. The word here is the dunamis word. It means strength, ability, power, universally inherent power, power residing in a thing by, its na by virtue of its nature or which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. In other words, it's in you all the time. It, it's in you. I mean, there's nothing else can be that dependable. There's nothing. I took Libby to get her hair cut one day. It was, uh, it was blowing snow and getting kind of iffy outside, so I drove her over to Hendersonville to get her hair cut. I got ready to leave. I turned the key on that Honda and it went, uh. I said, well, that can't be good. Uh. I had to borrow one of the hairdresser's car to jump that thing off so I could get to a place to get a battery in it. Everything is not dependable. Huh? But God is. He says, there is a power going to be residing in you. Now you say, well, I'm already baptized in the Holy Ghost. I got all the power I need. No, you don't. No, you don't. This next coming days, and the next coming days is as Pentecost is revealed, you're going to receive a power. Those of you who are hungry and thirsty for it, you're going to walk in a realm of power that you have never walked in before. Why? Because the times and seasons dictate that. That's what we need to be able to do. Finances are going to flow into the body of Christ. Why? Because that is what's needed. It's not so people can buy bigger houses and bigger cars and have bigger bank accounts. It's so that we might advance the kingdom of God and cause it to grow and prosper and set this thing up for his coming. Can somebody say amen? amen. All right. When we see this empowering take place, he said, once you're empowered, you're going to be a witness. That's where we get our English word martyr. Oh, we'll sing, I want to be a witness for Jesus. Are you willing to die for it? That's my question. Brother Aaron, you lived in China. You and Sunshine and your whole family. There are people dying over there for their Christian faith. Are there not? Daily they are. Why? Because they have got a power residing inside of them that they cannot hide and will not deny. But he says when you're a witness, it means one who is mindful and they, those who serve him by testimony. In other words, not just me getting up here with a microphone and preaching, it's how I live my life as a testimony. This coming Pente Pentecost is going to separate and thin the herd. 
That went over real big. He said, then you will go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, get this, and to the end of the earth. We like Jerusalem because we know how it works. Libby and I and Kenneth live in the freak capital of the world. Ken's smart enough to live outside the city limits. I live right in the mix of it. They are crazy people in Asheville, North Carolina. We, drove, we had a dinner appointment with a minister and his wife. Uh, actually, it was between lunch and dinner, about 4 o'clock, 4.30 yesterday afternoon. We got through with that. And we're driving home. And I said, we're just going to drive through downtown. Lord Jesus, deliver me. There were people, I mean, oh, yeah, we got COVID, wear a mask. They people out there, I wish they were wearing, wearing a mask. And we're out there, and they're everywhere. People packed in downtown. I mean, it's not even vacation time, and they were everywhere. But let me tell you, there is a power coming that we can... There is something about this generation that's being raised up right now. And I look at it and I say, God, how do I reach them? I've got a young man in my neighborhood. After it gets dark, he gets out there and practice sword play. He got a wooden sword. He's going Han Solo. He's a grown man. He's not a kid. He's a grown man. Got hair down to his waist, but he's a grown man. He gets out early in the morning, and the sun's coming up, and he greets the sun. And he gets out there, and he does all these funky things in yoga, and I'm thinking, man, you better than ESPN. A whole lot more fun to watch. That's the generation God says, I'm going to give you power to reach them. The world has written them off to live in their mama's basement and play video games. But God says, no, there is a root, there is a seed that I have placed in their lives and they're hungry. Do you realize that over 50% of the millennials are watching some sort of religious service on TV right now? Why? They're hungry for something. God, I got to go. How long have I been preaching? I'm just getting started. Listen. He says, you're going to go to where I send you. Now, Acts chapter 2. You know we Pentecostals love this chapter. Woo, hallelujah. I mean, this is where we can rear back and God becomes a four-syllable word, God. <laughs> you say, you shouldn't make fun of people. I are one. <laughs> I can't help it. I mean, I have seen the craziest things in the world you can imagine and blame it on God. We were in a church and the woman was a pastor. I'm standing on the front row and I, I mean, the music swing and sways going on and she does this. And there's a guy jumped the rail in front of the choir, had on patent white shoes. I mean, them slick looking things. And he takes off at a dead run around and around and around the building. And she goes, and he comes to a screeching halt and goes back and get the choir. And we blame that on God. God had nothing to do with that. It was just good choreography. I'm just telling you the truth. I've seen every dog and pony show you can imagine pulling rabbits out of the hat. I've seen it all. And then find out they lived ungodly lives in the background. Why do you think we're seeing ministers exposed for their corrupt lifestyle in this hour? Because God says, I'm preparing a bride without spot and without wrinkle and without blemish. You cannot lead from sin and expect people to be delivered. I know that sounds ugly. Do I, do I hurt for those people? I do. When God exposes their ungodliness and what they've been doing, I hurt for them. But God has to clean the house and thin the herd. That went over real big. But now, Acts chapter 2, i got to hurry. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, understand, you cannot make this happen. Amen. You can help it by being in line for it, but it's not something you just choose one day. Well, I suddenly I'm going to receive my Pentecost. You realize they tried to make me speak in tongues? I got born again about, well, I got born again in a Baptist church. Please don't hold that against me if you're a Baptist. That's great. But six months later, I met her. A year later, we're married. You know, so my life is changing drastically. We met these crazy Jesus people. Remember, this is early 70s. That's when the Jesus movement's full swing. Met this Jesus people, and this young lady was staying in our home while they were ministering in this area, and she got me cornered one night, 
and tried to get me to say, you know, hubba dabba do and yabba dabba do. And I said, I just stopped her. I said, lady, if it ain't real, I don't want it. I didn't know if it's real or not. I know Libby was baptized in the Holy Ghost, but she's young. She's crazy. She can her keep her serve. So you say, what happened? I just, I just sat that woman down and said, no, 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 don't try to make me say nothing. And I went to a back bedroom, and I got down on my knees, and I said, God, if this is real, I want it. Bam! And I ain't shut up yet. I have a spiritual son. He used to sneak into our church on Sunday nights. He said, y'all spoke in tongues up on the stage. He said, I'd never seen that before. He said, I said, Duh! I'm not just baptizing the Holy Ghost when I'm in church. Huh? I was talking to a pastor from another state. What day we have lunch? Thursday? Yeah. My phone rings. And I step out to take a phone call from a pastor in Tennessee. I just said the state, didn't I? Uh, but, but from Tennessee. And we were talking about some things that I had shared with him from the Lord. And he was, he, he was just clarifying, make sure he heard correctly, and uh, talking about what was going on. I said, you know, we got to deal with this splash and dash Pentecostal theology. Because we Pentecostals, we come into church, splash around in the Holy Ghost, and dash out the door and never, never experience it again until next Sunday. This Pentecost thing I'm talking about is going to take over your life. You're not going to be able to just splash around here on Sunday morning like we did here a little while ago. Now, I'm telling you right now, it got rich in here. And we want to splash, we, we want to splash around in that, but when we get outside those doors, we want to go back to how it was. And we can be a rook and a crook and a, a thug if we want to, as long as it don't happen in church. That day's, that day's past for those who are serious about this thing. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that one. When the day had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there were appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, understand this. This was not just something that happened. You've got to understand. 120 people are in the upper room. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse number 6. After he had seen, was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some had fallen asleep. 500 people saw him speak to them in Acts chapter 1. At least 500. Only 120 Show up. Now, why? Acts chapter 1 and verse number 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Three quarters of a mile. At a casual walk, 15, 20 minutes. And you lose 380 people on the way. Why? Not everybody wants the Pentecost. Huh? Because when you go a little longer, in, in Acts 1.15, it says that there was all together, the names was about 120. Why did 380 people say, I don't want that? I'm not saying they didn't get it later. But at that moment, they were not willing to take the journey. Let me ask you the question. Don't have to raise your hand. Are you ready to take this journey that God's bringing to the church? How serious are you, how serious are you about that? 380 said, I ain't going. They, they, were they intimidated? Very well could have been. Why? Because they were hunting men and women. They'd been with Jesus. 500 saw it, but only 120 said it. We can talk about this all day long, but how long are you going to linger outside the upper room? Get this. They're preparing for that. They were in one accord. Acts 126 says this as they're preparing. And they cast their lots, and the lot that fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, wait a minute. Jesus is dead. He hung himself, rope broke, his, his innards gushed out on the ground. That's what happened. He betrayed Jesus. There's 11. They set a criteria. Okay, before we can choose, we got to make sure that whoever replaces Judas walked with Jesus physically and saw him and heard him and knew him intimately. All right? So it came down to two men, Matthias, and one, he was called Barsippus, but also Justice, yeah. And the lot fell on Matthias. They used a worldly system to, to, to uh, draft spiritual leaders. That casting lots, that's what, the, that's what the Roman soldiers did for the robe of Jesus. Same thing. 
The church has become guilty of trying to incorporate worldly methods to set a heavenly standard. That day is coming to the close. You say, well, Brother Chuck, isn't that being a little harsh? Now, answer one question for me. Do you ever hear the name Matthias mentioned again? Get your concordance out and look. He ain't never heard from again. In the Bible I was studying from, he don't even have a footnote. He's, not that he was a bad man, but when you try to operate in the kingdom according to world standards, it never comes out the way God intended for it to do. We're helping set some order into different churches in their leadership. This is not a democracy. You have to let God speak. And we have been so intent to let personality, charisma, gift, and ability. Understand this. Your gift will take you places your character cannot hold up. Okay. I appreciate gifts. I love gifts of the Spirit. But what about fruit of the Spirit? Huh? God will honor gifts. Don't get me wrong. The world knows that. Our pastor's church in San Jose, California, sits in the middle of the cluster of Amazon, Yahoo, uh, help me out here, who else was, Apple, all these huge corporations are clustered around the, the area his church sits in. Understand this, all of those major corporations, every time one of their employees gives a tithe or offering to Redemption West, they match it and send the church a check for that amount. Why? They've learned the principle of sowing and reaping even though they are outside in an ungodly system, God's keys still work. Okay. Right. Oprah Winfrey, now you may love her, I don't have, you know, there's something hinky about that woman. <laughs> but she gives away 10% of everything she gets. We can't, I'm glad offerings done been took so you, you don't think I'm jumping on your back. But we have, we're afraid to mention giving from the pulpit. We'll, ra we'll run some people off. Huh? But yet the world has learned there are spiritual keys that operate no matter what. Oh, that went over big, Pastor Mike. That's what you want me to say? What? No, I, no, he did not. No, he did. No. We have got to understand, God's principles are in play here. And he says, let me choose who leads. Let me set aside. Let me do the one calling. It used to be an old saying, when he was daddy called and mama sent. Well, actually, it was mama, sent, mama called and daddy sent. That's what it was. We just let, you know, that's it. My, my mama, she was lost as a goose in a hailstorm when I got born again. I come home on a Friday and she said, where you been? I said, I've been to church. She said, church on Friday? I said, yeah, I got, I got saved. She said, well, good luck with that. <laughs> My mama was a pistol. I can talk about her now. She's been gone almost six years. And I don't believe in ghosts, so she can't come back and haunt me. The only ghost I believe is in the Holy Ghost. But she was a pistol. She whooped the socks off one of my aunts right in the middle of a dirt road called Ponder Creek over here in Madison County. Just, I mean, beat the hoo-ha out of her. You mouth off to my mama, you be picking teeth up. We moved out of the country. That was not a good thing because we, we, we moved out, out into civilization and we went out to visit my grandmother where we used to live and my older brother, the dummy, went out and broke switches. Come carrying them in. Mama said, what's those for? He said, well, you use all the wood around the house where we live now. I didn't want you to run out. And I said, you dummy. <laughs> My mama just whooped you out of principle. She didn't need a reason because she knew we had done something. <laughs> Maybe asked me when we got married, and I told her how I grew up out there on the farm in Madison County, just wandering the mountains. She said, were they not afraid somebody was going to take you boys? I said, honey, if somebody had took us, they'd brought us home by dark because they couldn't have handled us. I said, nobody wanted me and Ronnie. That's just how it was. How did I get off on that rabbit trail? Okay. But he says, let me choose. My mama was tickled when I called the priest. Why? Because she could tell everybody she was a pastor's mama. And she did every time she got the chance. All right, here they are in the upper room. They've set this thing in order the best they can. They've been getting their one accord, which means to be unanimous, having mutual consent, being in agreement, having group unity, having one mind and purpose. Now, wait a minute. Can that happen 
in the church? Only by Pentecost. That's the only way it can happen. Do you realize? How many knows what, what the chapter, John chapter 4 is? The story of the woman at the well. Here is a Samaritan woman. She is a multiple time married and divorced, and she's living with a man now she ain't married to. And here sits Jesus on the edge of a well, waiting. He, he says he was weary. The disciples have gone and get, food, get food. It was not even proper for Jesus to speak to this woman. But yet, he did. And the end results were, her city got born again, not because of her encounter with Jesus, but because they heard it for themselves. What was the thing that brought them together? A thirst. They sat down on the edge of that well. Why? They were both thirsty. She's coming to get water, and he's waiting for somebody to bring a bucket to get him some. When we have a mutual consent in the church, and it's not a Baptist co consent, it's not a Methodist consent, it's not a Presbyterian consent, it ain't even a Pentecostal charismatic full gospel consent. It is a thirst for the excellence of God, the glory of God to be revealed to this generation, then you will see cities changed. This Pentecost I see coming is going to erase the lines that man have drawn and said they could not cross them. Some will not cross because they don't like your music. Honey, it ain't about what music you like. Well, I just can't worship to that new, that new stuff. I, I like them old foot stomping, you know, shall we gather at the river. Well, then go jump in and get over it and come on back. Come on. I, do, I don't dictate what God says. I don't dictate what he honors. All right? Some people, if they had walked into the ark this morning, they'd have turned around and left and said, I ain't going in there. Then people got on blue jeans. All right, now, I'll be honest with you. There's churches that I preach in right now. Libby will verify and so will Ken. I have to wear, I have to wear a suit and tie. I go to churches. I cannot preach out of a new King James. Because that's King James only. Turn or burn. That's how it is. And you say, well, brother Chuck, you're making light of it. No, I'm saying that day's coming to a close. Why? Because we're going to have the common ground of thirst. We're going to know that there is a well that we can drink from. And to do so, you bring the bucket. I bring my thirst. I'm weary. I'm tired. You're weary. You're tired. But you use your bucket and we'll both drink from the same well. I'm not asking them to believe like I believe. I'm not asking them to preach like I preach. I'm not asking them to have your voice close up after you get through preaching. I'm not asking. I'm just asking that you give God glory. That's all I'm asking. You've probably heard me say this before. I don't care if you have tattoos. I don't care. I don't care if you've got so many body piercing that in a hard wind you whistle like a tea kettle. I don't care. All I want. This is my goal. My purpose, my passion, my dream is to see the glory of God revealed. I mean, I started praying the other night. And, you know, Moses said to, to, to God, said, God, if you ain't going, I ain't going. I just asked him to show your, your glory. I believe that God is raising up particular people, churches, ministries in certain areas. I'm coming to the context of some of them that they're going to be a hub, if you want to call it that, for the glory of God to be revealed. They're going to be so prepared, they're going to be so conditioned that every time they come together, and God is going to give each of them a specific anointing. You're going to see churches where healings take place as soon as people walk through the door. You're going to see churches that are so intent on worship that people will just be slain in the Spirit by the glory of God as they worship. You're going to see people in the deliverance ministry and not some flaky off the thing, off the wall thing. You're going to see prophetic hubs raised up where the Word of God is not bound by what some people think or some people say. That's not going to have that me too mentality that when some big name prophesies something, we just jump up and say me too. No, God is raising up people in this hour so that his glory can be revealed. Yeah. Mm. My God. And you say, well, you think you're one of them. I just think I have a job to do in it. Right. I'm not asking God for a position. I said just a place. Okay. Okay. I don't need a position. You say, well, don't you want to lead? No. One lady used to want to get shot first. <laughs> well, that's something else. We'll go on. Right and here we are. 
Hang on just a little while longer. I'll, I'll close this thing up. And Acts 2, 2 says this. And suddenly there came a sound. Say a sound. A sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. If you hang around me long, uh, Kenny and Libby will verify this because I do teachings on uh, the kingdom. Uh, and it takes about seven or eight weeks to go through them at least. And, and, and when I say the kingdom of heaven, we're not just talking about a place where you dance around on clouds all day and, and eat manna. The kingdom of heaven is the seat of a government. It's the seat of God's government. That's where He abides. That's where His throne is. And He says, here we are. There came a sound. The word sound there is where we get our English word echo. It's echios in Greek. He said, suddenly the sound of heaven echoed through a portal created by this being in one place in one accord, a people who had sought God's face. They had thinned the herd from 500 to 120. And God says, there we go. And it opened. What were they doing? I don't know. Praying, probably. Probably. Hanging out together, worshiping, probably. But whatever he did, it flipped the switch. And God said, there it is. And he said, open that door. And when he opened that door, there came this sound, this echo. And it's, they recognized and acknowledged that it was happening. What was happening there in their midst was first birth in heaven. It was not something that man created. I know great musicians. I do. Because of our background in music, I know great musicians, great singers. But I have heard them get up there and swing and sway and saw and crawl. And suddenly there's just no life in it. God is awakening a minstrel spirit and a psalmist spirit in the body of Christ. And it doesn't matter. Yes, I, I encourage you to be as good as you can. But when you have that anointing flow out of you, you might miss a chord every now and then. Or get off lick every now and then. Or hit, hit something on the piano wrong. And your voice may crack at a certain time. But the anointing overrules and overrides all of that. And suddenly there begins to be this sound released. Now you have to understand something. We have a record of that, of what's happening in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, at a time of mourning. They just didn't say, well, he dead. Sometimes they, they mourn for 30 days or 60 days. I mean, this was a time of mourning. Are we in what seems to be a season of mourning right now? I mean, I see, I see it in the church. I hear it in her voice. I mean, this past Friday, some of these guys were just devastated. But in a time of mourning when King Uzziah died, I saw, whoo, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Who sits on a throne? The king. <laughs> oh, can you handle a little bit more? High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, wait a minute. On the robe of the king, the length of the train was a reflection of how big his kingdom was. The longer the robe, the more powerful the king. How powerful his army was. His was so big. Now understand, he is in the temple. Who is the temple now? There's one in heaven, but we're the reflection of that temple on earth. And he says, my glory will fill that because my train of glory is so big, one temple can't contain it. If heaven's temple could not contain his glory train, then he says, you can't contain it all either. But jointly together, we are the body, we are this mass, massive temple, and his long and glorious train is filling us. And when that happens, guess what goes on then? Above it stood a seraphim. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, they're echoing this. One says it. One repeats it. One says it. One repeats it. What well, they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth, whole earth is full of his glory. Why? His train Amen. has escaped just the temple and now is filling the earth through these earthly tabernacles. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. It wasn't the voice of God that caused it to shake. 
Look at your Bible. That him is a little h. Him who is doing the crying out. When the people of God begin to cry out in this day of Pentecost, get ready because everything is going to be shaken. And the only thing that will remain is what cannot be shaken. And the glory of God will fill this earth and they will know that it's from Him and not birthed by man. Amen. When this COVID thing started, they set up a list of essentials. Grocery stores, essential. Post office, essential. Pharmacies, essential. Big business, not small business, big business, essential. They come to the church and said, ha, we don't need them. Why is that? Because we, are not, we were not offering anything they didn't already have. They could get their entertainment from the media. And that's what we, were, we had gotten into the habit of doing is entertaining people on Sunday morning rather than transforming them. Huh. And I ain't getting no amens on that, but hardly. Because we turned into a show. We turned into a production. Let me just stand before you and be honest. I've been guilty of that myself. Sunday mornings, I wanted it smoking. We started at 10 o'clock when we passed at 5 to 10. Sam man needed to kick in one of those tapes that had everybody doing the swing and sway coming in. And it just progressively got a little louder and a little louder and a little louder. And just because we couldn't afford them, we didn't have smoke machines. But Libby would step to the mic and we'd... <laughs> two chords in a cloud of dust, grab a hank of hair and hang on. We're going to have church. <laughs> not saying that God did not bless it to a degree, but never to what I see coming at this new Pentecost. Amen. Amen. Personality is going to die. We have come to worship. An individual behind a pulpit. Amen. I know you don't like to hear that, but we have. We have allowed ourselves to become enamored with flesh and blood. Now, now, you say, well, Brother Chuck, you hang around with some guys. I know. In my opinion, one of the greatest preachers in America today is, Pat, is Ron Carpenter, Jr. He's my friend. There's about 20 of us he calls his sons. He's my friend. I've been to his house at Christmas. Let me and I have had meals with him. We know them. But I do not worship Ron Carpenter, Jr. I don't. As good as he is. A mentor of mine just died, Bishop Tony Miller. Died a few, a few months ago now. He was a voice in my life. When I got the text that night that he had passed away about an hour earlier, the air got sucked out of the room. Libby and I were sitting in the living room reading. But he wasn't my, he, he, he's not my object of worship. I have lost people down through the years, and it devastated me. Why? Because I valued them physically over the gift that was in them. And God is reckoning that to be dead. Why? Because he says, he calls himself, he said, I'm a jealous God. He said, my glory I will not share with anybody else. And we see this day coming. Why? Because they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Acts 2, 5, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And, they, and when this sound, say sound, when this sound occurred, the, multi, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Now, wait a minute. In a lot of churches in the past, you had to have a Christian dictionary to go to there. Because we used phrasings that nobody outside the church understood. I call it Christianese. We speak a certain way. When I was a cop, we talked cop lingo. You know that. Because you're around people of the same ilk, the same manners. And you feel comfortable. Jermaine, you went through that too. You talk a different language. You hang around gearheads who like cars, they talk a different language. You, talk, you hang around drug, drug dealers, they talk a different language. Why? To keep their life a little more secret. And now God said, wait a minute, what I just did, He didn't baptize them in the Holy Ghost so they could speak in tongues and hoop and holler. Do I enjoy speaking in tongues? Yeah. But do I have to? No, it's my, it's, it's my discretion. You said, well, don't the Holy Ghost just take over you? No, He lets me do that. Why? He's in there. I can give him expression. Oh, I, there's times I have uh, such an unction I can't refrain from it, it seems. But there are times I just start praying in the Spirit when I ain't doing nothing else. I drive down the road praying in the Holy Ghost. Everybody thinks I'm talking on the phone. It's okay. <laughs> but God says, when I release this Pentecost, my people have a voice to 
that everybody understands. And they don't know. Why? Because you had Medes and Persians. You had all these different dialects out there. But with the sound they heard coming from 120 who had set themselves to seek God's face. And suddenly the portal opened and the Holy Ghost began to speak. They said, we don't know what we We don't understand this. But I know what they're saying. I hear, I, I hear words I understand. And the church is awakening to the fact that we can no longer be satisfied with just taking care of church. There's a business world out there. There's an education world out there. There's a government world out there. There's arts and entertainment. There's media. There's all family. There's all these different things out there other than just church. And suddenly here are these people... And when they heard him, he says, we heard them speaking in our own tongues. Get this. The wonderful works of God. Not the wonderful works of the ark. I shy away from people, especially pastors, and I'm around them all the time. They only want to talk about what their church is doing. They don't want to talk about kingdom. They want to talk about what they're doing. Now you say, well, Brother Chuck, they're doing some good things. But yeah, but we, we can't take credit for it. It ain't us. It's only by the inspiration of God. He says, they heard the wonderful works. That means magnificent, excellent, and the splendid works of God. And he says, then they were all amazed and perplexed. That means to be entirely at a loss. We don't know what's happened here. Most people right now, even outside the church, those who don't darken the doors, have an understanding of, or think they do, of what church is. But he says, when this happens, when you watch this happen in the coming days, we're going to cause a whole generation to be perplexed. It's no longer church as usual. No longer predictable. Do you realize how many people in a lot of churches we go to would have walked out because you went over 15, 20 minutes with worship? They'll act like they're going to the bathroom, but they're going to the parking lot. Huh? That's, what, that's, that's how we've trained ourselves. If we don't like it, there's a place down the street that we can. And we've set that up, and now they just come and go as they please. I call them, I call them gypsies. Okay. I call them gypsy believers, gyps, gy, gypsy Christians. Why? Just like gypsies, they come in, set up camp, make a mess, and leave, and you have to clean it up. Yeah. I make some people very uncomfortable because I've seen them in seven different churches. They'll see me and they'll go, oh God. <laughs> you say they hide from you. Yep. I hide from people in the grocery store. I'll hunker down behind the cantaloupes. I don't like a mask, but at least it helps you hide. I got to go on. Now, why is that important? This is my last scripture, I promise. I'm, I'm going to shut it down here. Listen to this. The world is watching the result of this upper room Pentecost experience. Not because they speak in tongues, but because they, they can finally understand what the church is saying. All the way down in Acts chapter 17, and I understand this, everybody's not going to go. Everybody's not going to embrace this. That's why I keep saying God's raising up a remnant. But Acts 17, verse number 5, but the Jews who were not persuaded, in other words, the unbelievers, being envious of what was happening by the church, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. Paul's been hiding there or laying, staying there and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city. And this is what they said, crying out, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now get this. They thought that was a bad thing, but when you break it down in Greek, that phrase, have turned the world upside down, means to stir up, excite, and unsettle. In other words, it takes their comfort zone and flips it on them. You're going to see millionaires who can no longer be satisfied being a millionaire. Watch it. You'll see billionaires turning over the majority of their money into humanitarian efforts looking for some relief. Why? Because God is unsaid. He's turning this world upside down. 
And get this, have you ever turned over a rock and watched what crawls out? There's a lot of ugly things come crawling out of there. We are about to see the revelation of God visit the seats of ungodliness and there's going to be exposed some of the people and some of the things that they have been doing and it's going to bring their downfall. Do not be surprised to see in the coming days prominent figures suddenly snatched out of their place of authority. Why? Because the light of God is going to reveal His truth and the glory of God that invades the church is going to turn their world how upside down and watch what crawls out can somebody say glory, glory. hallelujah stand with me if you would please